Hello, and greetings from the Center for Contemporary Mysticism in Philadelphia. My name is Joe Irwin, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to another one of our online programs. We have a great program for you today, which I'll introduce in just a moment. But first, I always like to welcome back friends, old friends, of which we have many, and new friends. It seems every week or month, new people find us, either through word of mouth or the website or social media. So if you're a new friend, we especially welcome you and hope that you can feel our hospitality. Uh, we also, if you're new, encourage you to visit our website. It's simply contemporarymysticism.org, but there you'll find all sorts of resources, hundreds of videos, inspirational postings, groups uh, that we meet weekly or monthly, which you might enjoy participating, and uh, a whole lot of resources. So be sure and check out our website, contemporarymysticism.org. Also, we, while most of our programs are free and open to the public, we remind people that we are a member-supported organization. So if you think the work we're doing is important, we welcome any support or contributions. Since we're not in person and can't set out a little basket on the table, if you want to drop by our website, there's a virtual donation basket there, and if you feel so moved, we're grateful for any support you might offer. So with that out of the way, we turn to our program today, which we've been looking forward to. Our program and our guest is Alan Seal. Alan is the founder and director of the Center for Transformational Presence. He's going to lead us in a discussion today about the heartbeat of transition. He's going to help us explore what does it mean to live a soul-directed life in a time of global and personal change. Why is transformational presence critical at this time? So I think there will be a lot of wonderful discussion we can have with Alan. So Alan, if you are there, we will invite you to come on board. There you are. Great. Hello, welcome. Hello. Welcome, welcome. And we'll also be joined by our own Patricia Pierce. As many of you know, she's a former pastor, a writer, and a spiritual teacher who donates most of her time today to supporting people who feel called to be part of the awakening in this global time that we're living in. So, Patricia, we're glad you're back with us, as always, and we're looking forward to a wonderful time together. Before I turn it over to Patricia and Alan for a bit of a dialogue, I'll remind you that that will be followed by a time of Q&A. So we like to have our program so that all of our attendees will have a chance, as many as we can get to, to be able to ask a question, offer a comment, and be able to dialogue with our guest, Alan, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So as you're uh, listening over the next few minutes to Alan and Patricia in their dialogue, if you have a question, a thought, a comment you might like to share or something you would like to dialogue with Alan about, jot it down and then use the little raise your hand button. So when we see the raise your hand buttons, we'll know that you might have a question or comment and we'll be able to bring you on and let you dialogue with Alan too, as many as we can get to. So that's our program for today and we're looking forward to it. We've been looking forward to meeting Alan and hearing more about his wonderful work, so we're going to do that now. So Patricia, I'll turn it over to you and we will be off and going. Thank you, Joe. And you. thank you, Alan, for... Uh for joining us today. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. And you and I had a chance to visit a few weeks ago, which really primed the pump for me um, mm -hmm. and my own curiosity about what I would like to speak with you today about. And first of all, I'd like to just have you talk with us about what you mean by transformational presence. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you today. And yes, I so enjoyed our conversation a couple of weeks ago, whenever that was. And so I've been looking forward to today as well. So transformational presence. Um, you know, when I first um, kind of had the idea of this, what, what is this transformational presence? It actually began, I was in, um, in Sweden leading a workshop. And it was a wonderful coach from Denmark who was in the workshop. And it was a four-day uh, soul mission, life vision workshop. And maybe in the second day, sometime in the middle, she came to me and she said, what are you doing? Just like that. <laughs> and and I, I said, well, I don't quite know how to answer that question. What do, what do you mean? What are you doing? I said, please tell me a little more. And she said, look, I've been in workshops all over the world. There are things happening in this room that I don't see happening other places. What are you doing? Wow. That was such a gift that she gave me in that moment. It was not because there was something 
magical that I was doing. It was simply about holding a space and setting a clear intention about what can happen there. And so when we talk about transformational presence, it is about creating a space. There was nobody talking about presence then. And if we were talking about presence, this was in 2006, um, if we were talking about presence, it was just about being present in the moment. Um, so be here now, coming from Ram Dass, you know. Right. Um, and yet I realized we're not having the second part of that conversation, which is what is the presence that you are bringing to this present moment? Mm. How are you showing up right now? And realizing that that was such a hugely important part of the conversation around leadership and and anyone who wants to make a difference in this world, how are you showing up in the moment? How do we want to be in our engagement with the world? And so that was kind of the idea of transformational presence was born in that moment, realizing that we need to be having this conversation. So what is it? That word presence, if we start there, it's simply referring to how are you showing up in the moment and what do people experience when they are with you? What do people feel when they're with you? I think that for most of us, if we reflect back over our lives to the people who have had the most impact on our lives, um, it's not so much the things that they did that we remember. We remember how it felt to be with them. We remember that that energy, that presence, that, yeah, how we felt when we were with them. Mm -hmm. And so presence, how do people feel when you walk in the room? What what happens there? And transformation, well, that's a word that's being used all over the place now. And, and, and when that happens, it's so easy to lose the, the essence, the power. What does that word really mean? It, it is essence. So if we come back to that, it comes from the Latin root transforma, which literally means change across form. Um, and in, in quantum physics terms, you might say it's a shift in vibrational frequency and pattern. It happens at the core of our being or at the core of a society or the core of a company. It's at the essence. And so I always say transformation is an, is an inside job. You know, we have mm -hmm. to start, get to the core as quickly as possible. Yes. Our work is so much about cutting through to the core as quickly as we can and then working from there out. So that if you drop the pebble in the water then and the rings go out, it's that, that's what transformational work is. It's about getting to the essence and then letting it move from there out. So then when we bring that, those two words together, transformational presence, um, I think of it like creating the best possible conditions, the best possible culture in which the greatest potential can unfold, in which transformation can take place, in which the people are lifted up to be the best of who they are. I think of it like tending a garden. If you're a gardener, you know that when you plant a seed, there's nothing you can do to make that seed grow. But there are lots of things you can do to encourage that seed to grow. So you pull the weeds, you make sure it gets the right amount of water and the right amount of sunlight. Maybe you fertilize it. You know, you, you tend the garden. Transformational presence is not about making things happening happen. It's about tending the garden mm. and creating the optimal culture. How do you show up in a way that lifts everyone up, that lifts the situation up, that calls forth greatness in everything that's happening in the moment to, to it's creating that culture. Yeah. And, and, and what you're saying is that tending of the garden begins within Yes. We have to tend our own garden. Of the inner How are you garden. showing up? What is the yeah. presence you're bringing to this moment? And just yeah. the fact that in that workshop, this person <laughs> would ask you, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but that really speaks to the transformational power of presence. It speaks so much to our, to intention, to living with intention, to being conscious of how we are engaging in this, in this world. Because when we talk about mystical experience, it's, it's actually not so magical if we recognize it's simply about paying attention. Yeah. There are messages everywhere. There's information everywhere. And we have the opportunity to shape the energy in a space. The Japanese talk about this, uh, this concept, ma. Uh, which is literally, well, they, they describe it as the, the empty space uh, the, or the negative space in a painting. And, Jap and Japanese paintings, you know, are so sparse. Yeah. And it's that space in between the objects in the painting. But it's the space in between yeah. 
two people, the space in between mm-hmm. two things in a room, the space in between the members of a team. What is the ma? And yeah. so if they were saying, what are you wanting to accomplish? And they would say, well, what's the ma in that project? What's the ma in that team? What's the ma mm-hmm. in that relationship? It's the silence in between the notes and the music. It's what's What's in the space in between? That's where the magic <laughs> Wasn't it Rubenstein who said, you know, about, you know, anybody can play the piano. It's the silence between the notes that's the music. Exactly. I mean, I'm exactly. totally paraphrasing. but um, And it's very Taoist also. Yes. That it is yeah. the emptiness, the empty space that we actually use. And, you know, in fact, when you talk about a transformational presence or a culture within ourselves, that empty space that silence um, is critical. It's being able to to get empty so that we can receive, so that we can be the vessel, so that we can be mm. the channel flowing through us. And so people often ask me what um, what form of meditation I recommend. And my response is whatever works. It's, you know, it's, yeah. we all have different style. We all have different ways that we engage. But my one condition on that is, that whatever your reflective practice is, some part of it must be spent in the silence. Yes. Because it's in the silence that the dots connect. It's in the silence that things come together and we, we have ahas throughout our day, but it's in the silence that all the pieces start to fit together. Right. And the clarity and comes. And as you're saying, not anything that we have to make happen. It's, no. it's being in that emptiness, that allowing, that that attentiveness it's getting out of the way getting out of the way exactly and yet there is that second piece of the intention of it you're getting out of the way out of the way so that Mm -hmm. and there's that there's an invitation in that and the invitation is really important yes yes so by the time you were at this workshop in 2006 in (laughs) denmark i believe you said you had already cultivated this ability in yourself, this this presence. Such um, a, yes, I think someone that noticed it. Uh, it this is, it I'm sorry. Yeah, it's such that someone was able to notice it and affected the whole. And I'm very curious, Alan, what in your life cultivated that in you? And were there turning points where you moved more deeply into that? I was really blessed um, in my growing up years to have some amazing wise elders um, in, in my in my surroundings. My father was a minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and um, through his career became fairly well known um, both nationally and globally in the church. And so, a part of the gift of that was that on any given weekend, sitting at our dining table might be someone from whatever country and or leading whatever role in the world in some way on a spiritual level. So I had that experience, but I also had my grandfather who was a farmer and a social worker long before people were social workers, his understanding and connection to people. And and his portrait is here on the wall beside my father's um, of just recognizing the, what I took simply by growing up with him. Um, they were, there was a woman named, who we called Cousin Lucy who lived next door to us when I was growing up. She was the unconditional love giver of my childhood. From the time I was six years old, she talked to me as an adult, not as a child. And I went to her house every afternoon after school and drank tea with her. And she taught me to play chess. And we had all kinds of projects and things that we did together. But she was amazing in her wisdom and her clarity um, and, and on it went through my life, um, that I've drawn people to me who just were not necessarily famous people. They were people who had huge open hearts mm. and to touch that. And then in my first career, I was a singer, um, in New York, an, an opera singer and a voice teacher for opera singers and, and music theater singers. So I learned a lot about what does it mean to hold a space on the stage? What does it mean to walk out and stand in front of the orchestra um, at Avery Fisher Hall? <laughs> well, it was it's called something else now, but once upon a time, it was Avery Fisher Hall when I sang there. But, but understanding something on an energetic level, 
of what does it mean to hold the space, to fully inhabit that space and wrap your arms, wrap your heart of love around the people in the back row of the top balcony and, and be present there in that way. And much of my performance life was actually in, in song recital. So not from a very intimate setting and then solo stuff orchestra. And so there was that opportunity in a different way than singing an opera role or a, a theater role where you're kind of playing a character. But when you're on the stage singing different songs or you're a solo of the orchestra, there's, there's this, a different kind of exchange with the audience that was such a gift for me. And I felt like, uh, in the in the late 90s and early 2000s, as I began this shift over into coaching work and personal development work and, and then leadership work, um, it's like all those years as a singer and as a teacher of singers was preparing me for this. It, it was the most natural transition across. I think from my father, watching my father in the pulpit on Sundays and how he held a space for the worship service and recognizing, even though I wouldn't have had these words to put around it then, but recognizing that there was an, he understood about an arc of design of worship, a, a, of an arc of liturgy, an arc of creating a, a space where people have experience. And that was something also that I understand or understood from an early point of realizing that our job is not to create experiences for people. It's to create um, moments in which they can have experience, create the structure, create the container, create the space that allows them to have whatever experience they have. Right. And everybody will have a different experience. That's right. Being held within that container. They'll, they'll receive what they need. They receive what they need. And, and I think that that's what makes when, when you can hold a space in that way, People are so deeply moved by that because there wasn't any manipulation with it. You simply created the space and let things unfold. Yeah. And um, it takes a lot of courage to, to do that, you know, that to not be manipulating the, the energy so much. And yet, yeah. oh my gosh, as you learn to ride that wave, it's the most incredible, the most yeah. incredible thing. Yeah. I think I mentioned in our previous conversation that when I was a pastor and I, I transitioned from preaching with a manuscript to extemporaneous preaching yes. and and letting go of control of what's going to happen in the moment and stepping into the moment and and being that that empty like setting my, setting the ego's agenda aside and being being present to whatever wants to come forth. It was terrifying when I first started doing it. Yes, I, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Because to step into that moment of the unknown and let go of control and be in that place of allowing. But then, like you said before, it's the emptiness, but then it's something that it's an invitation to something like, I'm not going to just stand there and like hold the space, like something is going to be coming through that, you know, the words will come. So I'm curious from your perspective, when you are holding space like that, what is your sense of, of the role of spirit and how are you like co-creating with things that are not visible or tangible uh, in a physical kind of a way? Um, beautiful question. In my work, because I, I, I'm working in leadership and with people from all different kinds of, of backgrounds and beliefs and no belief and whatever. Um, so we talk about the wave to ride. What is the wave that will carry us? And our work is based on three questions. And pretty much everything we do has these three questions woven in in one way or the other. The first question is what wants to happen? Now, what do I want or what do you want? There's something bigger at work here. There's a greater potential waiting to unfold in every situation. And we talk about the fact that there is a wisdom within what's happening. As difficult as it may be, there is a wisdom within that as if we will tap into that. So what wants to happen? And 
there are all kinds of variations to that question. What is, what's trying to get our attention? What is the shift that's trying to happen? What's the message that's trying to come through? Um, you know, what is the gift of this moment as difficult as it might be all different kinds of ways you can ask that question, but what wants to happen? And so in, for me, that's acknowledging that there is spirit, there is God, there is whatever you want to call that creative and sustaining force of the universe that I mostly think of as love. And so to hold that space of love, and then the second question is, so whatever that is that's wanting to happen, who's that asking you to be? Mm. How's it asking you to show up right now? What role is it asking you to play? And we're emphasizing all the time that it's, there's nothing to figure out about this. Listen, sense, feel. It will show you. It will tell you. And then the third question is, what's it asking you to do? Not the big master plan, but simply as the next step. As we're in this incredibly complex world now and leading in complexity, um, the, the, the long-term plan is not very relevant. <laughs> it's not helping us very much. But the ability to sense I feel like that's where we're called to go. I don't know how we get there, but here's the next step. This is what's opening up right now. Our ability to sense that. And so for me, to to come back to your question, is that that Holy Spirit, that love, that that, um, sense of a source of wisdom is within everything. And our job is to just listen and sense and feel, pay attention. It's there all the time. We we also talk about kind of a fourth level of leadership development that I, I mean I was taught growing up that the first there were three levels. You you followed a leader, and if we understand that we're all constantly shaping the consciousness of our present and future, the mass consciousness, then when you choose to follow a particular path, you, you're giving energy to that path. You're saying there's something valuable here, and others might look to you and say, well. Maybe I should look at that too. So there is an aspect of leadership in that. And then the second stage leadership for ourselves and the third stage leadership for others. Yet what's emerging on the, on the periphery of consciousness now is this recognizing that that potential, that wisdom, um, that source energy, that's the leader. Mm-hmm. And the job of the person with that title of leader is to listen and sense and feel yeah. and then translate that message to the people that you're leading and furthermore, help them to learn to listen to. Yes. So now the leader is, doesn't have to be the only one listening. We're yeah. all paying attention here. It's a complete shift in paradigm, but mm-hmm. to recognize there is something that wants to happen. There is mm-hmm. something here all the time. We, we always say a problem is not something to be solved. It's a message to be listened to. Uh, the problem is just trying to show us something that's not working and that there's another path that's trying to get our attention. So let the problem be your friend. Yeah. You know, and when you, when you said, Alan, um, so, you know, asking the question, what, what wants to happen? And then you said, we don't know how, uh, we don't know how this is going to happen. And I think a lot of us get stuck at the, because we don't know how we may sense. And I'm, I'm talking now also globally, like we are in this global moment of transition, yes, profound transition. And, and we may have a sense of where things want to go, what wants to happen, but from our vantage point, we can't see how. And I think a lot of times people then get stuck and, and, kind of shut down because they they can't see we can't see you know how we can't do the strategic plan right on this so, so how do we say say more in your experience um in terms of coaching people and guiding people to to be present in these moments of transition open listening uh, how do you coach them to let go of some of those concerns that might be more rooted in our need to control things? So first of all, there's um, maybe there's two different layers of that I want to talk about here to what you're saying. Um, so the first is, is recognizing um, a technique of a way to get there. And so we'll come back to that in a moment, but then to, to stay with these three questions um, the first step is recognizing that it's not only question number one, what wants to happen. There is also two and three. 
Who's that asking me to be? How's it ask, who's it asking us to be? And so there's the collective with that, or there is this particular committee, or there is this particular whatever. Um, and who's it asking me to be? And so, of course, we look at huge things happening in the world and say, how can I possibly make any difference with that? Well, maybe I can't in the whole world, but I can in my backyard, you know? And it's, so it's asking me to show up in a particular way. And then it's asking me to do something. And maybe it's asking me to have a conversation next. Maybe it's asking me to write, in my case, write an article about it. Uh, what is the, what is the way, um, that, or to open conversation among leaders that I work with to say, let's, let's look at this. How's this showing up for you? What does this mean in, in your setting? So that, we talked about with transformation that it's about getting to the essence, cutting through to the core. It's about cutting through and recognizing that when we're asking the question, how that question is paralyzing mm -hmm. and it blocks us from everything. Yep. How are we going to do it? Right. However, when we take away the question, how, and we replace it with what's our next step, just the next step. That's all. And if when we take that step, we'll find the next step. There's a, a that wonderful old sort of a gospel song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Yes. And uh, the second verse says, let not your heart be troubled. His tender voice I hear and resting on his goodness, I lose all doubt and fear. And then here's the line, though by the path he leadeth, but one step may I see. <laughs> his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me now that's within a certain tradition right. that right. those lyrics uh, however it's this is the bigger concept we're talking about I we get this sense there's something way over there that's calling us I don't know how we get there but here's the next step that's yeah. opening and then here's the next step so it's questions two and three that are a critical part of that and then coming back to and still um how do you listen? How do you pay attention in that way? And a part of how we work in transformational presence are such incredibly simple yet powerful questions that stretch you beyond the intellect. That the question is not so far out there that the intellect just says, I don't even know what to do with this, but are stretching enough that you have to, you have to move beyond the intellect in order to find that next step. Mm -hmm. And so when we, we don't really, our, our work is so intuitively based, but we don't talk about intuition. We just start playing with all kinds of simple tools of ways that just step by step stretch us open and your awareness um, begins to expand. Mm -hmm. So it's, as we always say, it's not, our job is not to tell people what to think. It's simply to expand how they think and realize that there's huge thinking in the heart and in the belly. And yes. those yes. three intelligences, the fact is if we let the heart and the belly lead the way, the head will always be there. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, but to recognize the Institute of Heart Math, I don't know if you've talked about that much here at, at the center, for, um, but their research in recognizing that the intelligence of the heart is and the electromagnetic field of the heart, which is the center of the intuitive mind, is 5,000 times bigger than the electromagnetic field of, of the intellect. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, to understand that when we can move into that, to, to listen from our heart and listen from our belly, we're accessing a field of information that's 5,000 times bigger than what we can yeah. access only by trying to figure it out. Yeah, so, and I think sometimes if the poor intellect, what we burden it with, expecting it to figure out things that it can't it can't it's it has, just it does not have the capacity for that yeah it just we're asking it to do things that it simply can't do it, and more and more i think people are learning to tune into the heart and into the yes heart. and and what's so important though alongside this is it's not about saying one or the other one is better than the other, is to recognize that they play different roles. Yes. The heart intelligence is really good at stretching way out mm -hmm. into the energy field of the situation and gathering information and bringing it back in. But it's not very good at organizing that information. Right. That's I'm what the intellect is really good at. <laughs> yes. And so it's like Absolutely. we start here to gather the information and then the head organizes that and makes a plan. And yep. so 
the two together in partnership is what is really critical. Right. Yes. I think of sometimes as the heart as the compass, um, you know, directing, like sensing the, the overall direction and movement. But yeah, like you're saying, the heart doesn't know how to like, you know, steer the wheel of the boat. Um, no, no. Or, or, you know, lift the sails or move the, the jig or whatever. So yeah. that's where the mind comes in, the intellect of the, the intellect. Yeah. So all of this, I suppose, would be wh- what we're talking about now is what it is, what it means to live a soul directed life, right? Mm. Asking these kinds of questions, tuning in to this. It's about kind recognizing of- that life is a dialogue constantly. And the more we can be in dialogue with everything that's happening around us and within us. So we listen before you talk. That's one of our things we talk about. Do you talk to life or do you let life talk to you? Um, so it starts with letting life talk to you and then you respond and it becomes this full circle of, of communication, which is essential. But we are always starting, we're taught to start by we, we talk to life. We tell it what we want to happen. We tell it what it needs to be. And if we just take a step back and say, what wants to happen? What is it that you're trying to show me? What's here? Yeah. Yeah. There's so much. Yeah. So you yourself, um, well, so the the title of this is, you know, the heartbeat of transition of this event. And we are, we're, we're getting into what it means to be open enough to sense when, when a transition wants to happen. And you yourself are in a moment of transition in your work. You're stepping back from some of the uh, workshop leading and and trainings that you've been doing. And so for you personally, you've been through transitions before in your own personal life. And we've talked a little bit about the global transition. And I think a lot of us, you know, it's, it's a holographic universe. So, you know, there's a global transition, but I think a lot of people personally are finding themselves in moments of transition and we're coming out of a pandemic, which is its own kind of transition. Huge. So what have you learned from your own personal transitions about what, what that requires of us and how you yourself have, what you have learned from going through transitions yourself? Um, We have a, sort of a mantra in transformational presence that is stand tall, be love, shine your light, listen and respond. And that kind of sums it up. It's also to recognize that the principle of correspondence, one of the ancient hermetic principles says as above, so below as below, so above. Whatever's happening out there on a global level is some way happening in, inside of me. And whatever's happening inside of me is some way happening out there. And so when we can begin to understand that the story might be different, it might look different on the surface, but underneath it's, there, there's some energetic essence that is the same playing in both. And it's the coming back to your question of how do we respond to these huge things happening in the world? Well, I start by... What, I, what do I need to get aligned inside of me? Mm-hmm. Because that's already going to start to make a difference in the mass consciousness. Where does that go? So what have I learned? And this, I think, I think that so many of the, the why, those wise elders in my youth, although we never talked about this, this is what they were showing me, the, the listen and sense and feel, the pay attention part. My father would never have given it that name. When I wrote my first book, Intuitive Living, he wrote me the most beautiful letter afterwards and said, you know, you have gone farther than so many people in the church and certainly certainly that I have ever gone Mm. in realizing there is another way to open and communicate and to, to pay attention. That's there for all of us. That's not just something special I can do. That's there for all of us. It's built into this technology, this human energy technology. And so what I've learned is that uh, I'm not saying that this is the right way for everyone, but for me, I haven't made a plan, maybe since I left graduate school. Mm. Um, It's about listening and right here comes an invitation. Here comes life is asking me for something. Well, what if I say yes to that and see where it takes me? 
uh, 20 years ago when I was making the shift from teaching singers and performing into what I thought was just was going to be life coaching, I, I had no idea that I would end up, I think I've taught in 18 different countries now and, and graduates of our program are coming from 35 countries. It's just, how did that happen? It happened by just saying yes to the service I was being asked for. And through that sensing that like six months to a year ahead, just feeling like ah, something's calling now in this direction, see what that is. For me now, at this point, um, it was that, well, if I step back to that shift from teaching singers to moving into this work, it was that feeling like, wow, I'm really good at this teaching singers. My singers were soloists at the Metropolitan Opera and all the biggest opera houses of the world. And, and that was great. And I was starting to feel like I'm not learning anything anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not being stretched. And there's something more I'm supposed to do than sit on the piano bench working with one singer at a time. That was wonderful work. I am so grateful for those years. And it was now there was that chapter was closing and something else was trying to happen. Listening to that and then enrolling in my first coach training and just let's see what happens with this and realizing absolutely this is the right thing. Okay. So follow that. And within two years, between 2001 and 2003, I completely shifted my work over to coaching, sold my apartment in New York and left. And then following through, and I was writing these books on personal development, but then something inside was saying, yeah, but where do you do with this personal development? Are you going to make a difference? Are you going to, what's the next step for that? And when I wrote Create a World That Works, um, I sent it to my publisher so she could turn it down. Because I thought this is, <laughs> this is not her kind of book. This is a leadership book now, not so much a personal, well, it's everything is personal development, but it's, you know, it was not the kind of books that we had done before. This was the, maybe the fourth or fifth book. And, and so within two days, she called me and said, I, I want to publish this book. And then she said, but we just have to tweak it. So it's more personal development. And I said, no, we have already done three really good personal development books. So what are you going to do with this? And it was scary for me because I, you know, I'd never spent a day in the corporate world in the out there in that kind of world. I was a, an artist. I, and yet there was that calling. It's like, you, you have to go here. This is your next growth. This is your next stretch, your next edge. And for all of us, if we're talking about living from soul, if we're talking about following our way through the transitions of our lives, there's something calling us. There's something saying, you know, it, it won't let go of you. Yes. It won't let go of you. Yes. And as you said, you have to walk away from your own competencies, the things that you're comfortable doing. Like you, you knew how to, how to coach these singers you knew how to write books on personal development and th those would, you know, that was like a niche for you. And you had to listen to that inner voice and follow it into new terrain. And I loved what you just said a moment ago, Alan, when you said you enrolled for this coaching program, let's see what happens. You said, let's see yeah. what happens. So there's that, that exploratory and experimental mindset too. curiosity. Yes. Let's see what happens. I'm yes. feeling this nudge. Let me do that. Let me do this and see what happens. You know, I say to the people I coach all the time when they're feeling like there is something next, I just, mm -hmm. and I say, just, so just open doors, open as many doors as you can open and see which ones stay open. Some will close. Mm -hmm. A lot of them will close, but some of them will stay open and then you'll know, okay, there's something, there's some place to go here. Mm -hmm. And this stretch, I think that this, this whole piece of how we move through transition is to realize that it is our biggest role or our biggest purpose for being here to learn. I, I believe it is. We're, to, we're learning and growing. And therefore, our biggest assignment is to pay attention. What's trying to get our attention next? And so following that next piece what's what is calling me through this transition now when i 
I had plans to stop my international travel in 2023. Well, then COVID had another plan. <laughs> and so, um, and I have had this sense for a long time that something is going to happen and you will not be able to travel. Not that something would happen to me, but out there in the world. And so it did. And so we moved everything to Zoom and it's been incredible uh, how that's unfolded. And yet I also knew, and it's time for me to step back. I've, I've For the last three years, I've been mentoring nine amazing uh, people who are all 20 years younger than me, who come from, from six different countries and are taking this work out to seven or eight languages and in other ways now. And so it was time to hand this to them yeah. because I felt the call, first of all, for more quiet. Mm. For me, it was time to live from an even deeper place, but I couldn't do that at the pace that I was keeping in the travel and the, and holding space that takes an enormous amount of energy to hold space for, for groups of people and on zoom even more because you're wrapping your arms around the world, not just around the room yeah. that you're in, you know? Yeah. And, and so I realized I love this work and it's time for the next step. Yeah. And, and to then work more in mentoring and coaching one-on-one -on -one with leaders and people who are so, they had a vision and so committed to making something. And so I just opened that door I announced that in, in September and October, I will teach the last of the big programs uh, for the last time. The others will take them. And I started opening my schedule for more coaching clients and they just keep coming. Mm. Um, and people who have beautiful visions, you know, um, and, and they're making a difference in the world in different ways. We have to be willing to stretch out of our comfort zone. And, if we're going to live from the soul, if we're going to live with spirit, if we're going to live in a, a mystical path, mystical experiences are not comfortable experiences. <laughs> That's often, for sure. You know, <laughs> That's for sure. You things happen, and we take you out of your out of your comfort zone. Years ago, when I was first teaching intuitive development in New York, and, and I would say to the students in the first class, "You will have experiences that your rational mind cannot explain. Please don't try." Just yeah. trust, trust your experience. Yeah. Trust that there's something inside of you that knows I have to keep following this path. Yes. And we Even talk about- Even if it doesn't make sense to the head. It doesn't necessarily make sense to the head, but your body understands it. Yeah. This yeah. wisdom understands it. And, yes. You know, we talk about the that when you get an answer and sometimes it's not the answer you wanted- and yet when it's the truth, when you know it's the answer to follow, something inside you opens. Yeah. Something you can breathe a little easier. Yeah. It's as if the container got bigger. And when it's the answer that you wanted, but something inside knows it's not right, <laughs> some, your breath gets a little tighter. Part of yeah. you is relieved and the other part is... Mm. Yeah. Yeah, this, the, the body, the, you know, and we, that's part of the tuning in, right? The tuning yeah. into the body because there's so much information that uh, the body can provide. Yeah. Well, Alan, I want to leave enough time for people if they have questions to ask them. Wonderful. Uh, because people may be in their own moments of transition or <laughs> being called out of their own comfort zones. Um, but I really want to thank you again. It's been delightful. Oh, thank you. I, it's been you. so wonderful having this uh this dialogue with you. So thank yeah, you. It's been that. great, Alan. Thank you. At this point, uh, Joe will come back on and lead us in the Q and a, and I'm going to do this magic thing where I turn off my video and I disappear poof into the air. Thanks again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank well, you. Patricia. If we have any uh, urgent questions for you, Patricia, we'll bring you back on Alan uh, and Patricia. That was just so wonderful. It, it, so many things you, you discuss resonate, uh, not only with me, but with our center. We have a weekly mindful meditation at the center and uh, do some of our own meditations as well as, you know, use other meditation teachers. But one of them that people love is called simply the space in between. And we even talk about something as simple. We start off by just observing our breath and we realize it's a cycle. You know, you take an in-breath and you take an out-breath. But if you pay attention between the end of that out breath and the beginning of the next in breath, there's a space. <laughs> and there's a little space in between that. 
And we kind of take that and build how the space in between relates to so much of all of life, whether it's uh, the space between words or the space between notes and music. So that resonates. And I think also um, the way you talked about um, stop asking how. You know, at the center, uh, we have a lot of inspirational speakers, and, and people will often kind of say, but what about me? You know, what can I do? And, and uh, you've given so much guidance in that, I think, about um, that maybe following spirit or the wave is not about learning how to do something, but it's being present and listening you see, that, that we don't have to necessarily go gain a new skill, but being present and listening to what what is the next step, which you've said quite a number of times. And and if we do that, uh, then we don't have to necessarily worry about, you know, what I need to learn to do, because probably no, you're already who you need to be. <laughs> if I can just say something more about that, um, it, people ask me, as an example, people ask me all the time, how do you write a book? Mm-hmm. I've written seven of them. I have no idea how you write a book because every one of them has been a completely different journey. Yeah. And yeah. The, the how that is so relevant for us, for where we are today in the world, is that you may accomplish something. You may have moved through, accomplished, created mm-hmm. a project mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. However, if you turn around and start to do that again, the ground has already shifted. Yeah. Right. The conditions are different. Right. So you know something about it. What I know about how to write a book is the kind of space and um, energy I need uh, around the writing time. Right. That I need chunks of time and I need, you know, some Mm. days at a time and I need quiet and and all those things. I know what what my style is for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But every book had a completely different journey beyond that. And so it's so important for us Again, here's the listen, sense, and feel. If we're trying to do everything from what we know already and how we did it before, mm-hmm. that's just not going to work very well. Right, right. That that's so so relevant. So we uh, let me encourage people. If you have a question, to raise your hand, and we'll bring you on. And uh, if you're bashful, uh, you can enter a question in our Q and A, and we'll get to that. It looks like we have a question from Alice. So let me see if we can bring Alice on. Alice, if you will watch and you can click to turn on your video and unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask a question to Alan. Just have to unmute, Alice. Remember to unmute. There you go. Super. Thank you very much for your your text. I'm sitting in Germany. Ah, okay. (laughs) My English is not that brilliant, but I would be interested in to hear about more of the first and especially the second question. Yes. How to um, to dive into what's going, what's want to be happened, and then how is it asking to show up? This is what I didn't get. So. Yes. So let me say, Alice, that uh, it doesn't have anything to do with your English. That second question is the one that people always get tripped up with. (laughs) So uh, especially when I when I'm working in a in a in a company, um, that that's the question that the words are so simple. Who's it asking you to be? And yet that's we're not used to asking that question. And so we always have to talk about that. It means how is it asking you to show up? What parts of you is it asking to come forward? Maybe there's a particular Mm -hmm. skill or a talent that you have, or maybe there's a particular role it's asking you to play right now, or perhaps um, it's asking you to be courageous or to be creative or to be honest uh, or to be playful. It's it's asking you to show up in some particular kind of way. A, A similar question to that is often when, when I'm working with people and, and I say, so you're going into the meeting or you're going into the conversation with your spouse or your child, it's the, the same, that mm-hmm. when you pause and ask, so what is it that I'm to be the steward for in this meeting? Maybe I'm the one who's holding a space for healing in our company right now. I don't have to talk about that. I'm just taking 
I'm holding that space for that. I'm being the steward for that. Or maybe I'm the one who is is the the steward for honesty right now, for being truthful. Are, is this really? Is this uh, we say this is who we are, and this is what we're doing? Is this re- what what is there? So to recognize that it's asking you to show up in a particular way. Is that making sense? Yeah. So it's a kind of preparation not knowing what is directly happened in the moment but it's a kind of preparation to get an idea or to get an uh, feeling probably where i have to prepare myself for not knowing what's happening in the moment right now but it what's happened what could can happen and it's it's very much that that way of sensing as you just say and yet you have no idea what's actually going to happen uh, in that moment. It's like when I'm sitting with a client or I'm sitting with a group and the conversation is unfolding and the time when I realize, hmm, the, the role for me right now is to step back out of the way. Things are happening here. Let that happen. Or to recognize they're spinning in circles. We aren't getting anywhere. Right now, it's my job to ask a question that creates a focus, not to... Not to be the consultant and tell them something, but Mm -hmm. to ask a question. Or right now, it's my job to hold a space and invite. uh, Perhaps that's a question that creates an invitation to the group. If it's as simple as, whoa, there's a lot of energy and it feels like there's a lot of misunderstanding in the room right now. What what do we need to take care of together? So it's a, it's, it's being totally, I would call it also in guidance to be in yes. guidance. Yes. You, yes. You being guided. Holy, mm-hmm. holy, holy, you can, we can use the word Holy Spirit here because you yes. used it at the beginning. So you are always on. You are, you are always on and mm-hmm. to, to, to get what's, what's going on it's in like, the, in it's, it's like you're always listening this way as well as listening this way. <laughs> you <Okay>. know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Always. Always, then I, always. <laughs> then I and the first question is: Is that more um, specific, or is it more open? A bigger, a bigger. It's a very, it's, yeah, it's a very open question, and we we can. I talk a little bit more about so what wants to happen. So that is not what do you want or what do I want, but in service of something bigger than us, in service of the whole, in service of a way that everybody gets some of what they need. Mm-hmm. What wants to happen here, and it's. The, the thing is that what I find so interesting is that once you just even with those couple of other sentences and people take a breath, they know and they can go there. So I've worked with the um, leadership teams of um, most of the countries in the world for IKEA with that company. I worked with, with their leaders and we open our I would spend two days with them. They know nothing about my work. Um, and we step in, and the first thing we do is ask those three questions. And we do it in a big exercise, so they're talking to a different partner every time and, you know, get the energy moving in the room. But the amazing thing is that in 20 minutes, they stop and say, I just got an answer to a question I've been struggling with for months. Mm -hmm. Because we simply took the moment to step back and ask instead of analyze and then tell it what we're going to, mm-hmm. we're busy talking to it. Just the act of taking a step back, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And the more practice, the more you practice, because everything about what we're talking about is a practice. The more you practice, the easier it gets and the more the flow gets and you, you kind of learn how your system works and how you do mm-hmm. here in sense. And that's not something I can teach you, but I can help you find how it works for you. Mm-hmm. There it is. Well, thank you, Alice. Those are such relevant questions, and uh, I see a couple more coming in on our on our Q and A of people who want to um, to get a better understanding between, I think, the taking the next step and being open, but what if the next step calls for some planning too? Uh, I've I've got a good one. Charlene is. His asking, she's on a huge transition, and she gives a very spe- specific example um, that Spirit's calling her to travel across country uh, from Pennsylvania to California. 
She'll be turning 25, I mean 65 on her trip. So obviously that's a pretty big next step. So I think she's asking how, you know, how you balance that need to do next step where the, obviously some planning needs to go on. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so thank you, Charlene. I was just reading your question as well. Um, I, I'm quite taken at the beginning just with your say, the in-between space is very empty uh, for you right now. And so we have been for the last year, uh, 15 months in the whole world in this liminal space. And to recognize that that liminal space is the space in between where you're no longer where you were before, you aren't where you're going. It's the space where the boundaries and the borders get very fuzzy. Um, it's that early morning space before it's, it's just, it's just barely light enough that you can make out the things in the room, but you can't quite tell exactly where everything is and what that is the same in our lives. So to first of all, recognize the power of this liminal space. And there's um, just as with stagnant water, we can think it's dead. There's nothing happening there yet underneath the surface. There's an enormous amount happening. This is the same in a liminal space that there's an enormous amount happening just under the surface yet. It, we're not, we can't sense what that is yet. So to be willing to wait in the, in the tarot, it's the hanged man <laughs> um, of being willing to be in that space of things have to come into place and it's going to take its own time. Um, the, the, the principle of gestation and the hermetic principles um, says that everything comes in its own time. The cake cannot be baked any faster than the chemical reactions can happen in the oven for that to happen. You know, so things have to come in their own time and to recognize this beautiful uh, thing of traveling across the country and um, kind of knowing where you're going, but you don't have much of a plan. Um, and so that's totally consistent with what we were talking about with, I have, I can get a sense of there's the destination. That's where we're being called to go. And here's the next step. And then as you take that step is the next one. And then the next one, it's kind of working with those three questions um, and recognizing that when you've taken that step from, from question number three, then you go back to question one. And now what wants to happen? And who's that asking me to be? And what's the next step? And then now what wants to happen? And as you do that, after three cycles, maybe something begins to shift and you begin to see, oh, maybe now I can see two or three steps down the path. I get a little sense of something more because we're, we're coming on to a path where finding what the arc is, we're finding the, the, the sense a direction that's pulling us in. The energy is starting to come together there. We're moving from the wave into the particle slowly and gradually um, as it comes. The key is that you have to keep listening. Your question has disappeared here, so I can't see everything else of what you've, you have you wrote, but um, it, it's that listening and paying attention all the time and knowing that there will be times when I just don't know. I just don't know. So it must be time to spend another day here, or it must be time to head out on the road again. And as I drive today, something else is going to come. There's another question that I uh, bring to my people all the time, which is when it's just setting a date and a time, whatever that is for you to say, so by Friday at lunchtime, I don't know how, but I'm asking the universe, God, Holy Spirit, whatever that is for you. Just, I will have clarity by Friday at noon. I will have mm -hmm. a sense of what is next. When you set that intention and you trust that that will be there, it's amazing how it generally comes much faster mm -hmm. than Friday at noon. But there's something about saying, I'm ready, show me. Mm -hmm. And here we find the next step. I, we've kind of wandered around here, but I hope that that's helpful. Thank, thank you, Charlene. That is, that's very helpful, I think, to all of us. Um, I have a, we have a question from Janet. So, Janet, if you want to come on and uh, click on your video and your unmute, we'll uh, bring you on for your question. Um, well, my question has actually evolved as I've been listening to you. Um, <laughs> Because I, I have a lot of personal experience where 
doing my inner healing work ripples out. Mm -hmm. And people that I was perhaps in conflict with, suddenly that vanishes when I have healed the, the knot in my own heart. The place that I think I um, perhaps resist what my heart says has to do with how, how we relate all of this to the suffering that is so visible in the world right now. We know that this is a time of tremendous transformation, a lot of very positive things happening, um, increased awareness. And at the same time, it seems as if um, horrifying things are, are so much um, in the headlines all the time. And I, I personally, if I listen to my body, my body says, don't read all those headlines. Um, my, my training and it feels like the message from the world says, oh, gotta know how bad things are. And um, so maybe my, my question has kind of morphed to, um, maybe you could just speak about how we can know that our best efforts to be that transformational presence, to be in an open-hearted um, energy, that that's enough. Yeah. And that it really makes a difference. It's a, it's a huge and wonderful question, Janet. So thank you for that. Um, and what, what I feel kind of called to talk about is... Um, we talked about the principle of correspondence. So as above, so below, as below, so above. And so those enormous things happening in the world. Um, and we also have things in our own lives. And one of the ways to be with that is um, to look at something that's happening in the world that is horrifying. And you know, if you, uh, if you have children, if you have raised children, or have helped any younger person find their way in life. Um, there are times when you wish it wasn't happening the way it was, <laughs> when they're making choices, when they are, things are happening that are very concerning. And there is that, that balance between holding them and loving them and doing everything that you can to support and at the same time recognize they're on their own path, they're on their own journey, and they have to take that journey. So it's not one or the other, it is both. And here we are in the world to recognize as well, to me, um, every country, every society, and every individual is on its own path of learning. And they have to take the journey that they have to take. That doesn't mean, so we're absolved of any responsibility. We don't have to do anything about that. They're on their own path. No, we can hold, we can send money for food. We can do, I mean, we can do whatever we can do and to recognize that they also have to take their journey. And uh, this is, I think, one of the hardest things for especially those of us with, with, with huge open hearts <laughs> um, and wanting to make a difference and wanting to be there. It's just the same whether it's the country or it's one of your children. Um, in my family, we had a, a, a violent death in the last few months. And that's been its own amazing journey of how could that have happened to her? And it was a murder and it was a really horrible situation. And looking at the journey that she was on and the healing that also happened in that moment. Um, there's just, the, the picture is so huge and it kind of, the more we can zoom in and out and be in the fullness of all of it, we're on the ground with our feet right in the middle of the situation and we are zoomed way out looking from a big picture view. That's, that's not easy. I'm not saying that that's an easy thing to do. And yet again, that's the practice. That's the practice. To be huge love in our hearts and present in every way we can be present. 
and also to recognize. And in the end, you have to walk your path. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Hmm. Thank, thank you. you, Janet. That was very helpful to all of us, I think. Uh, we have maybe one more question, time for one more question, and there's one that came in on the q and A. I'll pass along, Alan. Uh, it's from Ben, who just said, can you say a little more about space in between the in and out breath? Might have mm. referred to our mention of that meditation we did, but yeah. I think it was a call to just learn to identify that space in between in every aspect of life. You right. know, that's, that was kind of a starting point. And I think um, a lot of the, the meditations we do uh, reminds me there was a quote, I think, by Eckhart Tolle, who says, any time we realize we're not present, then at that moment we are present <laughs> because we've come back to being aware of our presence in the moment. But maybe taking that, you know, as kind of a starting point and say a little bit more of how you use that presence and the space in between. Well, in yeah, your the, work, space, Alan. the space in between is the, um, we say in our work, and, and thank you, Ben, for that question. And I, um, yeah, I recognize your Dutch name. I, I worked so much in the Netherlands. It's like a second home to me. Um, and uh, now you're in the UK. But um, that space in between, we, we talk about, Transformational presence work is built on three fundamental principles, um, which the ancient wisdom teachings gave us, and now quantum physics shows us the science behind. So the first is that everything is energy in motion and a part of a larger process unfolding. And so here we are with uh, uh, Janet that we were just speaking with, the, that larger process. And the second principle is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. So we can't get rid of a situation, but we can transform the situation. We can't get rid of a feeling or emotion, but we can transform that. The third principle, which comes to what you're speaking about, is um, that the world is built on a matrix of relationships. And to recognize that everything is about relationship between one thing or another. So as a coach, I'm not coaching the person. I'm not coaching the situation that they're in. I'm coaching the space in between the person and the situation. Mm -hmm. And so our work all the time, actually, is not about fixing anything. It's about shifting our relationship to what's happening in such a way that gives us another perspective, another understanding, another view, another way that, in a sense, we go, ah, here, here's the next step then, because something has shifted in, in our awareness. So when we talk about the space in between, it's in a relationship between two people. There are actually three in that relationship. <laughs> there's one person, there's the other person, and then there's the relationship itself. Yeah. The relationship is the space in between. And there's something that wants to happen in the space in between. So that when we say you and your partner, just say, uh, when I, I might ask you about the relationship, and you might start to talk about what does your partner want. But I'm asking you, what is the relationship want? The relationship is its own entity. The space in between the team and the project is its own entity. The space in between any two situations or any two people or people and the situation, the space in between is where the power is. When we shift the energy in that space in between, both things will start to shift in all the, the components of it. Something will happen there. And, and the other way around, of course. But, but recognizing that the space in between is, is where the power is. And so the in-breath and the out-breath, the space in between that, that's simply a stepping stone to help us realize that I take the breath in, there's a pause. And something's happening in that pause. And then I let it out, and there's a pause. If we can pay attention to that, and then pay attention to the space in between the sentences of what's being said, because we have to listen for as much of what's not being said as what is being said, for what is not being done as much as what is being done. And it's, it's, it's paying attention to what's, what's the in intention between uh, the person and the action that is taken. There's an intention that, that draws that in between, or there's a motivation, or there's a, a consciousness about that. So the space in between, there's the, that's where the power is. I hope that makes some sense. Thank you so much, Ben. That, that, thank you. Yeah, that was a great, uh, great question. Alan, thank you so much for being with us. 
this has been a wonderful time together, and it's it's encouraging to me to know that you and all the people you're training around the world are out there seeking to make a difference and to be a part of this transformation. That is very encouraging and hopeful. I think Thank you very speaks, much. Speaks it's to some of what Janet was saying. It's wonderful to know about the Center for Contemporary Mysticism and what you're doing, what you're yeah. bringing, and these, this is, it's all part of how we keep lifting the consciousness. Right. Well, you're very kind to say, and we're so grateful, and I think part of what we're doing in all of this is not just uh, exchanging information, but we're building community, you know, and today with this, uh, with the internet and Zoom, we can build far wider communities than we were able to do before. So that's a true blessing. And I think it will be a part of bringing that love that you talked about, which is kind of the essence of everything. So thank you so much. We wish you the richest blessings in your work ahead. And now that you're sort of part of the center family, we hopefully might see you back sometime in some other program as you progress along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you and blessings. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Godspeed. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, it's so wonderful to have Alan and Patricia. Thank you both for your dialogue and to everybody who participated in this. A great meeting. And to remind you, within a few days, we will have the recorded video of this uh, meeting on our website, contemporarymysticism.org. So if uh, you have friends whom you know would love to uh, watch and, and listen to this program, or you might want to see it again, be sure and refer them. Now, we are in the process of planning our fall program. It's in the works. We have some wonderful people coming up. We don't have the dates nailed down yet, but we'll be having an interview with the eminent Jungian analyst and spiritual teacher, teacher Dr. James Hollis. We'll have uh, one of the most exciting and spiritual, inspirational poets today, Chilan Harkin, and also people that are friends of the center for many years, such as Mari Perone and Mary Reed, will be back. So we have a lot of exciting things coming up this fall. So be sure and check our website, watch the email, and uh, you will be alerted as those come along. So remember, if you're new, uh, check our website. There are lots of resources there. Uh, and if you feel so moved, uh, there's opportunities for you to be able to support our work that we do together. So, until we meet again, be well, be love, and be present. And remember that you are perfect, just exactly as you are. Namaste.